Welcome to When Gen X Ruled the Multiplex, where I look at the films many of us members of Generation X watched during the 1980s and which might have helped shape us into the people we are today. I've already looked at many of the Gen X focused films made by John Hughes during this era, and today I'm looking at 1985's Weird Science, which Hughes wrote and directed. On the spectrum of Hughes' teen films, Weird Science is an outlier. It's a teen sex comedy, like his directorial debut Sixteen Candles, but unlike Sixteen Candles and unlike any of his sensitive teen dramas, like The Breakfast Club or Pretty in Pink or Some Kind of Wonderful, it lacks that empathetic core that characterized Hughes' films of this era. Weird Science exists solely to entertain, and if you're partial to 80s teen sex comedies, you will probably find that it achieves that goal. We open in a high school gym. Like the majority of John Hughes's films, Weird Science is set in an upper middle class Chicago suburb. As with The Breakfast Club and Ferris Bueller's Day Off, this high school is the fictional Shermer High. Nerdy students Gary and Wyatt spy on the girls' PE class and whine about how no one likes them. Gary is played by Anthony Michael Hall in his third and final starring role in a John Hughes film after his finely tuned performances in Sixteen Candles and The Breakfast Club. Wyatt is played by Elon Mitchell Smith, who also appeared in the late 80s Superboy TV series and starred in the 1988 film adaptation of the classic young adult novel The Chocolate War. These days, Mitchell Smith has mostly retired from acting and is a professor of medieval studies at Cal State University, Long Beach. A pair of bullies, Max and Ian, sneak up behind Wyatt and Gary and yank down their pants, humiliating them in front of all the girls. Max is played by Robert Russler, known in the 80s for films like Vamp and A Nightmare on Elm Street 2. Ian is played by our old friend Robert Downey Jr., whom we have seen in Less Than Zero and in the greatest trash film of the 80s, Tough Turf. In 1985, the year of this film's release, Downey and Anthony Michael Hall would become regular cast members on Saturday Night Live for a single deeply weird season. Opening credits roll while Oingo Boingo's title track plays. While spending the night at Wyatt's house while Wyatt's parents are out of town, Gary gets the idea to use Wyatt's Memotech MTX 512 home computer to create a computer-generated dream girl. So Wyatt sticks a five and a quarter inch floppy into the disk drive, and he and Gary set about designing the perfect woman, which of course involves an awful lot of debate about optimal breast size. To gain more power, they hack into what is clearly some kind of high security government computer. Because this film is designed for horny teens who thought war games was cool, but could have used more boobs. Wyatt and Gary rip out pages from issues of Playboy and feed them into the computer, along with photos of Einstein to make their dream girl brainy, and photos of David Lee Roth to make her an out-of-control loose cannon. To bring her to life, they wear bras on their head and hook a Barbie doll up to jumper cables. If you need to know why they're wearing bras on their head, Weird Science is probably not the film for you, because if you start asking questions now about why Wyatt and Gary do the things they do, you're gonna be sunk before this film even gets underway. Lightning strikes Wyatt's home and all hell breaks loose. All kinds of laws of physics are violated, and at the end of the chaos, a gorgeous woman wearing a crop top and bikini underwear is standing in the doorway. The woman is played by Kelly LeBrock, known at the time for the 1984 film The Woman in Red. She'd become a pop culture icon in the 80s for her much-parodied series of Pantene advertisements in which she begs viewers not to hate her because she's beautiful. Those commercials were ridiculous, but nonetheless, it's very hard to hate Kelly LeBrock for her beauty because she's so cool and so likable in Weird Science. Weird Science has become a cult favorite, even though it's a stupid mess, and a great part of its enduring appeal is due to LeBrock's performance. Speaking in a plummy English accent, the woman, who is named Lisa, asks Wyatt and Gary what they'd like to do with her first. And what they'd like to do is take a shower with her. Wyatt and Gary stand awkwardly under the nozzle, bare-chested but still clad in their jeans and sneakers, while the woman lathers up her perfect body and thanks them for bringing her to life. She then magically dresses Wyatt and Gary up in nice clothes and summons a pink convertible out of the ether for a night on the town. I'm gonna go ahead and call it magic because the science part of weird science doesn't seem like an accurate description of the kinds of things Lisa can do. Lisa takes Gary and Wyatt to a blues club in Chicago where they stick out like a pair of underaged sore thumbs. Patrons at this club include some dude played by John Kapalos, whom we have seen in Sixteen Candles in the Breakfast Club, who has, for some unfathomable reason, decided to don a Cuban accent for this role. Gary gets stinking drunk and adopts a persona based on a famous character from Richard Pryor's stand-up act, the Bayou-born street corner philosopher Mudbone. It's an interesting choice. 
There are a ton of really odd creative decisions in this scene, which lasts for approximately a million highly awkward years. Back home, Wyatt and Gary run afoul of Wyatt's horrible and vicious older brother Chet. Chet is played by the late Bill Paxton, whom we have seen in The Terminator, Streets of Fire, and Near Dark. Because as near as I can tell, Bill Paxton appeared in every single bleeding last film in the 80s. Later that night, Lisa gives Wyatt comprehensive lessons in how to kiss. Since Elon Mitchell Smith was one of the few stars of teen films in the 80s who both looked like and was an actual teenager, you're probably going to find yourself wishing the pretty 20-something lady Lady would stop sticking her tongue down that poor kid's throat. Wyatt wakes after a night he can't quite remember to find himself wearing Lisa's underwear, though Lisa tells him he passed out before they had sex. Gary and Wyatt hit the mall with Lisa. While Lisa buys skimpy underthings at a lingerie shop where the clerk seems scandalized at the very idea that anyone would want to buy these skimpy underthings on sale at her shop, Max and Ian dump slushies down on Wyatt and Gary from the second floor food court. In one of those fleeting details that absolutely anchors this film in the world of 1985, Wyatt deals with this very public humiliation by whipping out a spray bottle of Banaka breath freshener. Every teenager I knew in 1985, myself very much included, carried Banaka absolutely everywhere. That and a tube of Maybelline kissing potion would see you through every emergency. Max and Ian's long-suffering girlfriends Deb and Hilly, played respectively by Suzanne Snyder and Judy Aronson, are disgusted with the behavior of their boorish boyfriends. While the Van Halen cover of the Roy Orbison classic Oh Pretty Woman blasts, Max and Ian spot Lisa. Instantly horny for her, they tear through them all in hot pursuit. They're shocked yet intrigued to discover she's devoted to Gary and Wyatt. Lisa spontaneously invites Max and Ian to a big party at Wyatt's Home. Before the party, Lisa drops by Gary's home and meets his stodgy parents, Al and Lucy, played by Britt Leach and Barbara Lang. Gary's folks are alarmed by Lisa's aggressive sexual confidence, especially when she describes the party as sex, drugs, rock and roll, chips, dips, chains, whips, your basic high school orgy kind of thing. Scandalized, Al decides to call the cops. Lisa points a gun at him and takes off with Gary, magically wiping his parents' memories of the incident. Hundreds of kids swarm Wyatt's house for the party. They consume a lavish buffet and drink copiously and have pillows fights while Wyatt and Gary hide in the bathroom. While Max and Ian pant over Lisa, Deb and Hilly join Wyatt and Gary in the bathroom for some awkward conversation. 80s by Killing Joke plays while Max and Ian approach Gary and Wyatt and propose a trade. They'll give Wyatt and Gary Deb and Hilly in exchange for Lisa. Which really isn't how dating works, but nothing about this film is anchored in gritty reality. Wyatt and Gary and Max and Ian all strap bras to their heads and fire up the computer in the hopes of creating another woman like Lisa. This time, things go crazily wrong. They forget to hook up the Barbie doll to the jumper cables and instead bring life to a Pershing ICBM from a Time Magazine cover photo. If you think this film has gone completely off the rails, you are correct, and it's not over yet. Lisa decides Wyatt and Gary need to become more confident, so she magically summons a biker gang to crash the party. The gang is led by a ferocious biker played by Vernon Wells, who played the ferocious biker Wes in The Road Warrior. And as near as I can tell, he is playing the exact same character here, which is pretty awesome. If for no other reason, I will always love Weird Science for unexpectedly pivoting from a teen sex romp to a Mad Max spinoff in the third act. Other members of the biker gang include Michael Berryman from The Hills Have Eyes and Jennifer Balgobin, whom we have seen playing sexy punks in Repo Man and Cherry 2000. The bikers set about trashing Wyatt's home while Lisa urges Wyatt and Gary to find their inner courage and stop them. Gary and Wyatt's inner courage remain safely hidden until the bikers target Deb and Hilly. Gary whips out Lisa's gun and orders them to go, whereupon the bikers politely apologize for the trouble and leave. This show of bravado is enough to make Deb and Hilly fall deeply in love with Wyatt. Wyatt and Gary. Tenderness by General Public plays in the morning as Wyatt and Gary drive their brand new girlfriends to their respective homes. Upon returning to Wyatt's place, they discover Lisa has turned Chet into a talking pile of crap. Lisa bids a fond farewell to Gary and Wyatt and vanishes from their lives, leaving them more popular and newly sexually confident. As a coda, Lisa pops up at the school as the new PE teacher, where she dazzles a bunch of horny teen boys. Weird Science did fairly well at the box office, though it was outperformed by The Breakfast Club, John Hughes's other 1985 release. In conversations about the lasting impact of John Hughes's 1980s teen films, Weird Science is the one most likely to be viewed as inessential, because it doesn't position itself as trying to provide a voice for angsty Gen X teenagers. It's just there to grab a few dumb laughs. That's not to say the film has had no impact. A Weird Science spin-off TV series ran for five seasons from 1994 to 1998 on the USA Network. With a premise about awkward teen boys magically creating an adult woman to teach them about sex, 
facts, weird science could have gone in many directions, ranging from thought-provoking to deeply unsavory. Weird science falls somewhere kind of in the middle of that spectrum. Overall, it mostly works because Lisa is an unexpectedly great character. She's funny, yet brazen, yet sophisticated, yet kind-hearted. Anthony Michael Hall and Elon Mitchell Smith are both funny and likable as teen losers Gary and Wyatt, and Robert Russler and Robert Downey Jr. are a pretty entertaining pair of comedic villains. But this is Kelly LeBrock's film. When Gary tries to reassure Deb about his relationship with Lisa, he describes Lisa as being like a big sister, and that's exactly how LeBrock plays it. Lisa is the cool, if inappropriate, older sibling who buys you beer and takes you to awesome parties and beats up anyone who hassles you, and also provides you with a great example of how life is going to be a whole lot more fun once you get a little older. Weird Science is a trifle. The runtime is only 94 minutes, and even still, it doesn't seem like there's quite enough story to fill it. And Lord knows that whole party sequence, which takes up a full half of the film, is a sloppy mess. You won't learn anything from Weird Science, and I have a sneaking suspicion you might wind up losing some brain cells by the time you reach the end. But if you're in the mood for an entertainingly stupid and sleazy high school comedy, Weird Science can be a fun and nostalgic blast from the past. Next time we are going to cavort with Tom Cruise and unicorns when I look at Ridley Scott's Legend. Thank you for joining me, I hope to see you for that.